My name is Danute e Emilia Niteki. My age is 84. I have had macular degeneration diagnosed for 12 years now. Danute Niteki is one of numerous clinical patients at the Berkeley School of Optometry's Eye Center who have been referred to Susanna Chung's Low Vision Research Lab. Well, what, what we do most is to try to understand the factors that limit vision for people who have central vision loss and hoping that by understanding how vision is being processed uh, when they have bilateral central vision loss, then maybe we can develop something that can help them see better or function better. Now I have to, if I want to see any kind of detail, if I can see at all, I have to look a little bit sideways above or below the particular object that I'm looking at. So one of the things uh, is to basically identify the area outside the, the scotoma that they can use consistently and that is what people call the peripheral retinal locus or PRL uh, which pretty much function like a new fovea. So uh, a lot of our more recent work focus on understanding the, the, the vision at the PLL and also how the brain basically compensate for the fact that the vision uh, is gone in that area. So uh, that is what we also call uh, plasticity and it is kind of a big thing like in neuroscience these days. Okay, very nice. So look at the center of the cross and um, when it disappears the E will show up and then you tell us where the E is pointing. Ready, go. Up. Ready, go. Left. So reading is the number one goal of many low vision patients coming to see us in a low vision clinic. And a lot of time they would like to be able to read again or even to read better. I have now to use rather large magnifiers to read anything and it is so slow. And one of the things that uh, we find is being effective to help people to read uh, better or more efficiently is what we call perceptual learning. So what we normally ask uh, the participant to do, for example in this case, uh, Dr. Litaki, is to look, basically fixate at a certain position and then read the words as quickly and as accurately as possible. Ready, go. Of course, we were very sorry the thing has happened. We have the subject uh, with central vision loss uh, come into the lab uh, six sessions, so it's six weeks. And each week they just came in and read for like an hour and a half or something like that, again and again. Uh, and we show that the improvement in reading speed is like about 50%. To honor her significant and continuing contributions to the field of low vision research, the American Optometric Foundation proudly presents the Glenn A. Fry Lecture Award to Dr. Susanna Chung. The Glenn A. Fry Award Lecture is sponsored by the American Optometric Foundation. This award is named after one of optometry's premier vision scientists and educators. Dr. Fry's research and publications vaulted him to the front ranks of several fields, including visual and space perception, color vision, visual optics, and vision standards. Dr. Fry established the first university-level PhD program associated with optometry, implemented a research model for education, and is credited as having played a major role in elevating the profession of optometry. Dr. Henry Hofstetter has referred to Dr. Fry as the American Helmholtz. The video that follows will introduce you to this year's Glenn Fry Award lecturer, Dr. Susanna Chung, of the University of California, Berkeley School of Optometry. Dr. Chung has made outstanding contributions to our knowledge of low vision, reading, mechanisms underlying visual performance in normal and impaired vision, and the breadth of her work is truly representative of an individual who is most worthy of the Glenn Fry Award. It, it is an honor and a pleasure for me to present this year's Glenn A. Fry Award recipient, Dr. Susanna Chung, who will now present her lecture entitled, Plasticity of the Visual System, 
following central vision loss. Thank you, Chris. It is indeed a great honor to receive this award that is named after one of the giants in optometry, Dr. Glenn Fry. Dr. Fry and I are actually related. How? Let's look at my academic family tree. <laughs> so here are my academic fathers, oops, academic grandfathers, and Dr. Fry was actually my academic great-grandfather. As you can see, my academic fathers and grandfathers all received the Grand Fry Award in previous years. So enough of that. Um, since I got my PhD from the University of Houston, I have been focusing my research efforts on understanding the factors that limit vision for people with low vision, in particular, people with central vision loss. As most of you know, the leading cause of central vision loss is age-related macular degeneration, AMD, which is also the leading cause of blindness for people who are older than 65 years of age. Currently, there are approximately 2.3 million of Americans who have the dry or the wet form of the AMD. So the goals of my work are twofold. First, I would like to understand the factors that limit vision in people with central vision loss. Then I would also like to be able to develop more effective rehabilitative strategies to improve functional vision for these individuals. And today I would like to talk to you about the topic of plasticity. Is there plasticity going on in the visual system for these people who are a bit older and also have vision loss? And if so, how can we take advantage of the fact that there is plasticity to help people with central vision loss to improve their functional vision? So here is a video recording um, of the, oops, sorry, of the uh, fundus. And actually, this was from Dr. Detecki, the this uh, patient that you saw in the video. So the area here is the, the macular lesion, which, when projected into the visual space, represents a scotoma. Now, when we asked her to look at the center of the cross, she consistently put the cross at a location which is outside the macular lesion as represented by the blue rectangle. The pink rectangle represents the fovea. So the location that she chose to look at the cross is what we call the preferred retinal locus, PLL for short. The PLL is also referred to as the new fovea or the pseudofovea, which just means that when the fovea is not functioning, then people will pick another location outside the macular lesion and use that to serve as like a new reference or kind of like a surrogate fovea. So to date, we know very little about the properties at the PLL. But the fact that people can actually find a location outside the macular lesion and use it relatively consistently to replace the fovea by itself is already evidence that there is plasticity going on in the visual system following central vision loss. But today I'm going to show you some evidence from my lab showing the oculomotor as well as sensory evidence at the PLL. And at the end, I would like to sum it up with um, how we could actually use this to help people to improve their functional vision. So let's start with the oculomotor evidence. More than 20 years ago, Janice White and Harold Bedell from Houston show that when people with bilateral central vision loss were asked to perform a saccadic task, they consistently put the saccadic stimulus on the PLL, not on the fovea. They took this as evidence that there is oculomotor re-referencing. That means the PLL basically take on the role as the fovea. However, saccadic eye movements are voluntary eye movements. If oculomotor re-referencing is a volitional task, then what we should be looking at is involuntary eye movement. So we look at um, the, the fixational eye movement, in particular, the fixational saccades. We use the Rodin star scanning laser or thermoscope SLO to present our visual stimuli and to collect data. The SLO allows us to image the retinal fundus while at the same time put the stimulus at the desired location. In other words, we could collect structural and functional data at the same time. So for this experiment, we asked observers to look at the, the cross and, um, he, uh, for trials of 30 seconds. And of course, we did multiple trials. So on your left, uh, show the fixational eye movement of an older adult with normal vision. On the right, uh, shows the fixational eye movement of someone with AMD. Again, that's actually the subject in the, uh, in the video. So the SLO captures images at 30 hertz. When we uh, look at the 
position of this cross, and then when we take uh, the location of it, take the average of it, then that represents the coordinates of the PLL. Then we also mark where the fovea is. To do so, we measure the distance from the center of the optic nerve head to the um, fixation cross in a group of older adults with normal vision. Then we took this number, put it onto the fundus of someone with central vision loss, and then we could mark the fovea as represented by the pink rectangle in, uh, on the right. So now we know the coordinates of the, of the PLL with respect to the uh, fovea. To analyze our fixation of our eye movement, we adopted an analysis that takes advantage of the scanning natures of the images. What that means is that for a scan image, the top field lines will actually scan at different time compared with the bottom field lines, or basically each line was scanned at a different time. So what we did was we took a trial which normally have 900 frames, and then we took out all the good, good frames, put them together, and formed what we call the reference frame. Then we took one strip of the image from a single frame that consists of a few scans, and then we cross-correlated it with the reference frame. So this gave us the XY position of those few uh, scan lines at that particular time. Then we repeated this for multiple strips of the same frame. So this allowed us to analyze our data at a higher frame rate that, than the 30 hertz that was offered by the SLO. And of course, we did this for multiple frames, and effectively, we analyzed our data at 540 hertz. So with all these XY positions, then we could put, plot the eye movement traces. So here we have the eye position as a function of time for someone with normal vision and uh, for someone with AMD, showing you the horizontal and the vertical eye movements. So if you look at the panel on the right, all those vertical jumps represent the fixational saccades. As you can see, the uh, people with uh, macular degeneration made larger amplitude fixational saccades, but that's not surprising. And what we are more interested in is to see where are these fixation saccades going? Are they directed toward the fovea, which means that there is no oculomotor re-referencing, or are they directed toward the PLL, which will be evidence that there is oculomotor re-referencing. So this is a cartoon showing a scotoma with the fovea there not functioning, and the PLL outside is uh, the scotoma. So let's say this is the position of a stimulus prior to a fixation saccade, and now the observer made a fixation eye movement and landed here. Then the difference between the landing position and the PLL is what we call the vector error with respect to the PLL. And the difference between the landing position and the fovea is what we call the vector error with respect to the fovea. And if one of these um, is actually smaller than the other, that means most of the fixation saccades are directed toward that as the origin. So here are the vector error comparison with vector error with respect to the fovea on the y-axis and vector error with respect to the PLL on the x-axis. For all our observers, the vector error with respect to the PLL are smaller than two degrees, but the vector error with respect to the fovea range from one to 11 degrees. So this set of data show that the vector error with respect to the PLL is smaller. In other words, most of the fixation saccades are directed toward the PLL and not the fovea. So this is evidence that there is ocular motor re-referencing but how complete is the re-referencing process? So we developed what we call the re-referencing index. To calculate the re-referencing index, we compare the magnitude of uh, the vector error with respect to the PLL and the vector error with respect to the fovea. We took the difference of these two and then compared that difference to the distance between the fovea and the PLL. And this is the equation that we use to calculate the re-referencing index. All those numbers were just to scale it uh, to into zero and one. So if someone made a fixation saccade all the way to the PLL, then the re-referencing index would be one. If the fixation saccade is directed toward the fovea, then the re-referencing index would be zero. So here we have the re-referencing indexes for the 22 observers for whom we have the data. And the range was from 0.56 to 0.98 with a mean of 0.82. So this set of data indicates that for people with long-standing central vision loss, the fixation saccades are directed mostly toward the PLL, and it indicates a really high degree of ocular motor re-referencing. Okay, the ocular motor system have um, plasticity, but what about the sensory system? 
So if somebody uh, will be using the PLL again and again and again, wouldn't you expect that the visual performance will improve at the PLL? And so when we think about visual performance, at least when I think about it, the first thing that comes to my mind would be visual acuity. So the question is, is the acuity at the PLL better than what you would expect based on the normal periphery? To answer the question, we used the tumbling E task upside, up, down, right, left, uh, and presented it using the SLO so that we know exactly which retinal location the observer was using to do the task. Um, for comparison, we also tested a group of normally sighted older adults at 5, 10, 15 degrees in the lower field and the nasal field. So we have uh, resolution acuity NOGMA as a function of retinal eccentricity. The data here are from the normally sighted observers measuring the periphery. And here are the data for the people with central vision loss. Each one was plotted with respect to the PLL. As you can see, for all 17 observers with long-standing central vision loss, the acuity at the PLL was much worse than what you would expect based on the uh, retinal eccentricity. So you will say, well, Susanna, this is evidence against plasticity. Uh, perhaps so. But the way we interpret the data is that this is evidence showing that the plasticity may not affect acuity. After all, acuity to a certain extent will be limited by cone separation or cone density. So perhaps plasticity just cannot change the anatomical structure. So if that's the case, we want to turn to a different task, limited at a different level. So we turn to the task of crowding. For the conditions in the room, you probably have to experience that when you measure acuity, especially in young children, in embryos, or in people with central vision loss. The single letter acuity is often better than whole line acuity or even whole chart acuity. So the fact that we can see something in isolation much better uh, than when the object is surrounded by other junk is what we call the crowding effect. Back in the 1960s, Dr. Merch from already showed that crowding is limited uh, at the cortical level. So here we are going to look at whether there's evidence that there is plasticity at the PLL with respect to a crowding task. So about two decades ago, Les Toet and Dennis Levi published this seminal paper showing the two-dimensional shape of the crowding zone. What they did was they asked the observer to identify the orientation of a T, up, down, right, left, the one in the middle, and is flanked on both sides by two other T's. And they measured the minimum separation between one of the flanking T to the target, such that the observers could identify the orientation of the middle T at 75% correct. They did this when the T's were oriented horizontally, vertically, and in the two oblique directions. And the separation are now plotted here um, on, on the left here. And the, the and uh, along each meridian and for six um, observers. So this set of data was obtained at the Fovia. Now, if we just kind of look at this, this basically represents the two-dimensional shape of the crowding. And this set of data could be uh, described pretty well by a circle. But in the periphery, the story changes. This circle becomes this little dot there. And also, the size of the crowding zone becomes bigger in the periphery. And it gets even bigger when you go further away from the periphery. But what is most important is that the shape of the crowding zone changes. It changes from being circular at the fovea to being elongated and even elliptical in the periphery, with the major axis pointing radially toward the fovea. So we are going to use this signature of the crowding zone to test whether there is plasticity going on at the PLL for people with central vision loss. Here's the hypothesis. For people with normal vision, the crowding zone will be circular at the fovea, elliptical in the periphery. If there is no re-referencing going on for people with central vision loss, then we would expect that at the PLL, which is at the peripheral location, the shape of the crowding zone should be elliptical. But if there is re-referencing going on, such that the PLL becomes more like the fovea, then the crowding zone should be circular. So to test our hypothesis, we use the SL again, we presented a letters on each trial, and the letters were from the 26 lowercase letters of the alphabet. And the letters were oriented horizontally, vertically, and in two oblique direction. And remember that um, the SLO pictures are actually flipped upside down. So in the SLO, the observer actually see these letters as upright, not upside down letters. So they were asked to identify these middle letters. 
and we measure the minimum separation between one of the flanker from the target so that the observers could identify the middle letters at 50% correct. And again, we also tested a group of older, older subjects with normal vision at the fovea and at 5 and 10 degrees in the lower field and nasal field. Here's how we are going to present the data in the visual field domain. Upper field, lower field, nasal field, temporal field. The center will be the fixation. Here are the data for the uh, normally sighted observers. Each line, if you could see the line, represent the separation between the target and the flanker so that the observers could see the target at a 50% correct. And the ellipses were the best fitting ellipses to the set of data. Um, at the fovea, remember these are from people with normal vision. At the fovea, the problem zone is circular, but in the periphery, uh, we find that the problem zones are indeed elliptical with the radial axis pointing toward the fovea. So this set of data resembles those of Toad and Nephi really well. But what about for people with central vision loss? So I'm going to show you the crowding zone of 11 observers with central vision loss. Each one uh, is plotted with respect to the PLL. So here are the data. So for all 11 observers, um, the shape of the crowding zone are not as elliptical as what you would expect based on the normal periphery. And even when they are elliptical, the major axes do not necessarily point toward the fovea. So this is what we are thinking. At the PLL, before the central vision loss, the crowding zone is, ellip is, is elliptical, just like in the normal periphery. But then, after the central vision loss, they have been using it again and again, and that becomes more circular. But is that because the major axis shrinks in size, or is that because the minor axis expand in size? So here we are comparing the spatial extent of crowding, or just one dimensional, along the major and minor axis um, for people with central vision loss and in the, with the normal periphery. The gray symbols plotted here are just from the normal periphery. Here are the data for people with central vision loss. The spatial extent of crowding along the minor axis was actually very comparable between those from patients with central vision loss and also in the normal periphery. But the spatial extent of crowding along the major axis is smaller in people with central vision loss compared with the normal periphery. So what that means is that it's the major axis that shrinks in size instead of the minor axis expanding in size. And these are consistent with some of the data published in the lab showing that with practice, you could actually reduce crowding such that the crowding zone reduces in size. Okay, well, we show that there is plasticity going on at the PLL such that the shape of the crowding zone becomes circular. But perhaps a stronger test would be to test at a location that is outside the PLL, which is more like the peripheral vision of people with central vision loss. And here's the hypothesis. So at a location away from the um, PLL, let's say here, the shape of the crowding zone should be elliptical. But if there is re-referencing going on with respect to the PLL, then the radial axis of this uh, off-PLL location should have the major axis pointing radially toward the PLL. But if there is no re-referencing going on, then the shape of the crowding zone here should still be elliptical. But now the major axis should be pointing toward the fovea. So we are going to map out the two-dimensional shape of the crowding zone at a location away from the PLL. And here's an example. Um, so the cross represents the PLL. This is the fovea. And this is our testing location. So on each trial, now we only present two letters, lowercase letters. One at the testing location and one along uh, one of the seven meridians that we were going to test. So this is what we call the franker. And we basically measure the minimum separation between the, tar the target and the franker so that the observers could identify the target letter at 50% correct. So here are the data. The length of each yellow line basically represents how far apart you have to pull the flanker away from the target in order for the observers to identify the letters at 50% correct. So when we look at this, we thought, hmm, this doesn't look like we could just use one single ellipse to fit the data. But we could describe the data pretty well using two superimposed ellipses, with one pointing toward the fovea and the other pointing toward uh, the PLL. And here are the data for the three observers for whom we have the um, data. And this is a really hard experiment for the observers uh, to do because they pretty much have to use a location away from the PLL. In all three cases, 
the crowding zone at the location away from the PLL could be described by two superimposed ellipses with one pointing toward the fulvia and the, one point, the other one pointing toward uh, the PLL. So this indicated there is re-referencing going on, but it is not complete. So hopefully by now you are a bit convinced that there is um, ocular motor re re plasticity going on in the ocular motor and sensory visual system. But how could we take advantage of this to help people with central vision loss improve their functional vision? So we turn to perceptual learning. Perceptual learning just means that with practice, then there will be changes in the sensory system so that people can actually improve in their visual performance. So because a lot of low vision patients, especially those with central vision loss, would like to be able to read again or to improve their fun reading speed. So the first experiment we did with perceptual learning was to see if we could improve their reading speed. We measure reading speed using the rapid zero visual presentation RSVP paradigm, which just means that we present the words one at a time, always on the same location on the computer, and ask the observers to read as quickly and as accurately as possible, as you see in the video. So this paradigm minimizes the need to make intraword uh, eye movement. We use sentences. Each sentence is between 8 to 14 words, and we just count how many words were word read correctly at the end of the sentence. So here are how we present the data. Now, when we um, change the word exposure duration, then we could manipulate the whole range of performance. If the words were fresh one after the other really quickly, then the performance would be very poor. But if we gave the observers a lot of time to read each word, then um, they could get to perfection. So we get a whole range of performance, and we operationally defined reading speed based on the duration that gave us 80% of the words that were read correctly. In this example, it would be 194 words per minute. Now that would be for like one condition, like one print size, and we could repeat this from other print sizes to get a better idea how reading speed changes with print size. So we did this for all the um, observers before training. So in general, reading speed increases with print size up to the critical print size, and then stay at the maximum reading speed. And we pick a print size that corresponded to 1.4 times the critical print size and use that for training. So here are the data uh, during training. On the y-axis is reading speed in words per minute. X-axis is training block. As I said in the video, five of the six observers came in for six training sessions. This one came in only for five training sessions. There were 10 blocks in each session, and then basically there were 30 sentences in each block. Each circle represents the reading speed estimated based on one of those blocks, about 30 sentences, about 330 words that they saw. In general, reading speed improved for all observers. The average improvement was about 53%. What that means is that if you are reading at about 100 words per minute before training, after training, you will be reading at 153 words per minute. We also use the SLO uh, to measure the fixation characteristic just to make sure that there is no changes in the uh, PLL location or the fixation stability. So we also compare uh, four things before and after training. Maximum reading speed, critical print size, BCEA by, contour, by, by rare rate contour ellipse area, a measurement of fixation stability, and we show a QT as measured using the bailey Luffy chart. So the dash line is the one to one line. Only maximum reading speed improved after training, but there is no change in critical print size, no change in fixation stability, and no change in visual acuity. What this means is that I could help you to improve your reading speed through perceptual learning, but I cannot help you see anything smaller. And this is also consistent with what I showed you earlier, that there is no plasticity for an acuity task. In summary, we have found that there are considerable changes in the ocular motor and spatial properties at and around the PLL. These are evidence of experience-dependent plasticity even later in life and in response to bilateral central vision loss. So what we are doing now in the lab is to try to apply perceptual learning, which needs the plasticity to be there, to help people to see better. So we are trying to see what are the best training schedule, frequency, amount of training, um, tasks, etc., hoping that we could help people with central vision loss improve their functional vision. So I would like to thank NIH for uh, supporting my research and also through the uh, core center grant to the University of Houston and UC Berkeley that allows me to use the facility and also the training grant that allows the trainee to work in the lab. I am uh, really blessed to have many, many good collaborators who work with me in the past who helped me out so much. So uh, these are the list of the people, not as long as Larry. 
the names that are highlighted in blue are the people who, who directly contributed to the work that I just described. Thank you very much.